There is no patient confidentiality. Perpendicular, bro. You're going this way. The truck is going this way. I'm gonna get squashed. Oh my days. You, you have to, you have to listen to this. I'll be back. Woo! <laughs> Yes, 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 yes. Alright, okay, I know the background, the, it, it looks kind of... <coughs> but yeah, anyway, your boy is back after traveling seven, seven weeks, uh, seven weeks, right, through Southeast Asia and doing placement in brain surgery and joint surgery in Hanoi. In this video, I'll be sharing my honest experiences on my elective, what aspects I hated, what aspects I loved, and also I'll be giving some tips throughout the video. If you are currently organizing your elective, and I really recommend you watching this video right here. It's by this YouTuber who like does like sick videos, you know. And if you like this video, make sure to subscribe for videos every Tuesday. You know, I do vlogs, I do helpful videos like this one. And I'm not like every other medical YouTuber. No, I'm different. I'm brown. Great. Hospital placement. Now in Vietnam, Hanoi, yeah, there's a massive language barrier. It's quite hard to find people who can speak English. So talking to a patient or taking a history from the patient is a, it's, it's a bit of a savior. You'd have to find someone to like translate for you to the patient uh, when taking a history. Um, and, but not all doctors could speak good English. Uh, in fact, some didn't speak English at all. But that didn't stop the doctors from making such a massive effort to try and teach you and try to make you understand. And not only that, but some of the doctors could speak really good English as well. So that was great for teaching. There were some differences that I picked up between the hospital system in Vietnam and the hospital system in the UK. Uh, that I want to talk about as well. Bit of a mad one actually. Just a disclaimer, I'm not dissing like Vietnam hospitals or the hospital that I did my placement in. It's just like, it's just so different um, to how medicine I think is practiced in the UK, which I just find really interesting. So one difference is there is no patient confidentiality. Bro, you're allowed to take pictures and videos in the operating theater of the patient, of their insides, bro. You're allowed to go into a ward and just take a picture of, of all the stuff in, in, <laughs> Listen to this, in, um, in patient discussions where doctors are together in a room and they're discussing through each patient case saying, okay, patient A has this problem, this is what we're going to do, this is their background. The doctors did that in a room where all the patients were there with them. So when they were discussing through patient A's case, patient B, C, D, E, all the other patients were there also listening to each other's sort of cases. So they sort of they could hear and they could know what each other had been through. That was mad. And also during the ward rounds, like when you go into sort of these uh, rooms with the patients in, a room there that would fit perhaps like one or two patients here in the UK, they put in like five patients, five Vietnamese patients there in, in this sort of one room or one area. And that was just because of like, there was so many patients that they had to deal with and they had to make do with the space they had. Um, and also, yeah, there's just no patient confidentiality there either as well. <laughs> like on the ward round, the surgeon would talk to one of the patients and say and explain to them, okay, this is the problem uh, and this is what we're going to do to you as well. This is like the steps, this is the management plan basically. And then whilst the surgeon was explaining that to the patient, there were like three other patients just watching and just listening and be like, oh, right, yeah, yeah. The thing is, it didn't feel like a breach of privacy. It felt more actually like camaraderie like they were there to support each other, which was um, which was nice to see if, if I'm being honest. But it's just mad because I know like stuff like that would never run in the UK. Like you'd never see like patient confidentiality being breached like that in the UK. That it was just like mad for me to see, very different. Another difference, oh my days, you, you, have, to, you have to listen to this. So imagine in an operating theater, they've just done with one patient. That patient is like now prepped, ready to go back to their ward. They're just waiting for the porter to come and transport that patient, wheel them back to their ward. Imagine before that happens, so that patient's still in the operating theater, they, they, they take the next patient in, bro. They, they, the next patient that's gonna have their operation done, they bring them in. So it's like two patients in the same operation theater. One of them has just got their surgery done and the other one is getting prepped. Like they're getting the iodine on their head or they're getting the iodine on wh wherever the surgery is taking place. Like that is mad as well. At one point, I just, <laughs> at one point I remember seeing the two patients and just them both being lied down and just looking at each other. And I just thought, yo, that's, it's, it's different, man. It's, it's so different. Another thing as well, like for some of the surgeries, they wouldn't be under anesthetic before they entered the operating theater. They would go into the operating theater awake and then be put under anesthetic inside the operating theater. And I don't think that happens in the UK. I think they knock you out 
I think before you go into the operating theater, from my understanding. Okay, I'm gonna have to say this, yeah, there's, there's a bit of sus stuff. Okay, imagine this is what happened as well. A surgeon who was scrubbed in, they had, they had their gloves on and they had blood on their gloves. So they were busy with an operation. They came in to our operating theater from another operation, bro. So they had blood from another patient on their gloves and they came into our operating theater and they would come in just to see what was going on, just to see what went on with the surgeon and how the operation was going. Or it might have just been that they needed something like a little equipment or just to ask a question. That happened like loads. Like if you imagine there's operating theaters next to each other, separated by doors obviously, but then staff and nurses and doctors would like just go in and out just to see like what was happening and and just, you know, it, that, it literally could just be that. Like they just wanted to see what was going on in the operation. Like they were just interested or ask a question or they just needed equipment. That's how it worked, dude. Like it was just it was very different to the UK. I'm trying to not, <laughs> I'm trying to not diss or make these hospitals look bad, but it's just, I want to just point out like, it's just a massive difference. And it's very eye opening to see that. I was very shocked. Despite all that, one of the surgeons said that the infection rates aren't high, like it's uh, below 2% or something. And also, you know, they, they obviously, they scrubbed in properly and they did use aseptic technique. They didn't like touch other stuff. But yeah, it's just, uh, the, it worked differently over there. Listen to this as well. Doctors over there in Vietnam, they do not get paid very much at all. One of the doctors explained like maybe 6,000 US dollars a year a year six thousand us dollars a year and some a lot of doctors don't even make that that's like quite a good salary apparently at least for that hospital or, um at least for the doctors over there and yeah sure vietnam is quite cheap right like the living costs aren't too high they're quite low but considering the amount of work that these doctors put in we saw one doctor he did a night shift and he stayed there the next day to do a morning shift as well a day shift so considering the amount of work and time a lot of these doctors put in, it's nothing. They get paid really little. Oh yeah, <laughs> uh, you could smoke. You could smoke in the doctor's room. The doctors could smoke in the doctor's room. Built different, the people. Now guys, I'll be, I'm gonna be completely honest in this video. At first, I didn't like it in Vietnam. Like the first two weeks, I, I really didn't enjoy it. In fact, I actually, like tried to find any opportunity to like escape to another country. Like I went to Indonesia for a few days um, and honestly that was just to escape uh, Vietnam. Part of the reason why I didn't enjoy Vietnam at first was because prior to this we had traveled around Malaysia and we found the people of Malaysia to be like so welcoming like they were proper nice, so so nice. I'm talking about me going to like this little like restaurant and them only accepting cash, I had no cash, and this local paid for a coconut drink and a whole meal, bro, on the beach. Like, Malaysian people, they're smiling at you, they're, they're so nice. And likewise to, you know, basically all that part of Asia, they're just so nice, they're so welcoming. They smile at you and they make conversation and they try and help you as well. But our experiences in Vietnam, it wasn't the same as that in the first few weeks. Um, people didn't, sometimes they didn't really smile at you back. We would walk down a street of shopkeepers and the shopkeepers would turn their head away when they saw us coming. We would say, Xin chào, like hello to some people and they just wouldn't reply back. Bro, we got so many stares as well, like bare people like staring at us and you know, it just, it makes you feel like out of place. It doesn't, it's, it's not a nice feeling. Now at first we thought it could be due to culture, like, you know, the fact that they're not really smiling back or responding. Uh, to our greetings. It could just be that they're a bit more introverted. But then, like when we went to the gym, we saw how the locals interacted with each other and they were so lively. And even our hospital as well, like the doctors and staff and the nurses, they were so like, they were joking around. They were just like very normal and very jolly towards each other. And so I was thinking like, yo, like, well, why are they not like this towards us? Like, is, is, is it because I was brown? And the answer is, it goes back to the thing that I talked about before, there being such a massive language barrier in Vietnam. Lots of people, it's, it's quite hard to find someone who speaks English in Vietnam. Bro, I remember, <laughs> bro, I remember on my second day of placement, I got lost. Bro, I arrived at my hospital 30 minutes before I was supposed to meet with this doctor. I ended up being 10 minutes late because I was lost and I, and I, I couldn't ask directions from people. I had to use Google Translate and like sign language and I went to this department and I went to this part of the building and I was so frustrated. Not other people because I, I can fully understand like I'm not expecting anyone to speak English there because it, it, you know why would they need it? It's the other part of the world. Like I never got angry at people for not being able to speak English but obviously the situation is frustrating when you sort of feel helpless. Like you, you feel like no one can help you. You're by yourself. And yeah then I thought due to that massive language barrier a lot of the locals 
are just a bit more reluctant to talk to, talk to tourists purely out of shyness, not out of any sort of rudeness or because they're not as welcoming. In fact, as well, in our last two weeks of staying in Vietnam, we had a much more positive experience with the locals. I ended up loving the people. I met so many nice people, just randomly as well. Like I'd be at a coffee shop and people would just like talk to me and I'd make conversation. Taxi drivers, taxi drivers are always really nice. And bro, the doctors at the hospital, they were so, they were incredibly nice. Imagine, <laughs> imagine this brain surgeon, yeah? He's at like the head of the department, he's like, big boss yeah he's he's a boss in the middle of the operations he would like sit down with me and talk with me and then he would be he would offer we'd eat candy together bro he would make green tea with me they had this tea in the operating theater again i i don't know how uh aseptic this is yeah but uh this is just how it runs in vietnam they had green tea they poured me green tea they gave me ban kiao candy nut candy vietnamese candy it was so nice and everyone yeah the, the doctors and staff i saw a much more positive, welcoming and warm side to the people in my last two weeks. Perhaps because, you know, I, I gave them more of a chance. Maybe like I just got myself out of there or um, I don't know, but I just, you know, I ended up loving the people. Bro, taxi drivers shaking your hand at, at the end of the trip because they're genuinely happy that you were there in their country. They, they were so nice. And you know, what? I'm so glad I got exposed to the real side of the Vietnamese people because at first, as I said, I was thinking, yo, this experience, yeah, clapped but no that wasn't the case the city okay first things first yeah oh my gosh the roads mad there's no rules do you do you remember wwe yeah extreme rules like no rules people you know hitting each other with uh, uh chairs steel chairs and using those butts with the nails around them it, it was like that motorcycles going this way motorcycles going that way you could be driving down a lane and there was motorcycles coming towards you and you were thinking what is what is going on oh my gosh there was this one time there was this one time i was on the back of this scooter taxi it was late at night we we're going down this main road and we we're going to this restaurant right bro main road cars and vehicles are going fast we're going fast down this main road imagine imagine being on a motorway and a massive truck pulls out starts pulling out on the motorway and you're on the edge on the back of this scooter taxi, yeah? And imagine perpendicular, bro. You're going this way, the truck is going this way. Perpendicular, it starts pulling out. And you're on the edge, and you're thinking, yo, I'm gonna get squashed, yeah? I kid you not, I'm not kidding legit. Everything went in slow motion, and I remember just going, Bismillah, like that, oh my gosh. Live switch to slow-mo 120 frame rates per second, bro. Bro, I'm convinced the only reason why all the scooter taxis I took are still alive, yeah, is because I read Ayoto Kurusi and I blew on your helmet. You're welcome. <laughs> on a real, like legit, I would say never ever, like do not ride a motorcycle or motorbike or a scooter or anything. Don't ride anything in the main cities like Hanoi or Ho Chi Minh just because it's it's too much of a risk. Scooter taxi, so we use Grab to get around. It's cheap and it, it's relatively safe-ish as long as you like stay off the main roads and um, you know, don't go on a journey for more than like 10 minutes. The reason why I'm saying this is that like, my friends were in the emergency department and they saw so many people who got into road traffic accidents and who were, you know, riding a scooter. Even on a like two minute journey, my friend was telling me on a two minute journey, someone thought, oh, it's only two minutes. Let me not wear a helmet. They ended up having to get brain surgery because they got in such a bad road traffic accident. So that's how dangerous it is in the main cities like Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh. But, you know, being on the back of a motorcycle in Hanoi or Ho Chi Minh is uh, definitely experience. It's, uh, it's dangerous, but um, it's fun. Crossing the roads as well, it's not as dangerous as people think or as it looks. It does look crazy, but generally the vehicles on most of the roads aren't going too quick. Um, and also they do drive to avoid you. Like I've seen locals just walk out on a massive like roundabout. Imagine like cars and vehicles going everywhere and they're just like walking along. They're not really looking around. They're not like rushing along. And also as well, if you just leave enough space and time between you and the oncoming vehicles, then you should be fine. It's something you get used to, I think, after like a week or, or two. One week, yeah, one week should be enough. Food. If you're vegetarian or you can't eat pork like me, then... It's a bit of stick one still. I can't lie, it's difficult because a big part of the cuisine is pork, is meat, alcohol as well. And so unless you go to Ho Chi Minh, there are very few halal spots in Hanoi. I will say though, I think it wasn't as bad as we thought when we arrived there, uh, just because we found out there to be a lot more vegetarian spots, a lot more 
uh, vegan spots as well in our last sort of week being in Hanoi. But if I'm being honest, yeah, a lot of the vegetarian restaurants, dead. Dead, 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 dead. The egg coffee though, amazing. Vietnamese coffee, amazing. And um, yeah, that's... <laughs> That's it. <laughs> yeah, that's just that's just from a Muslim perspective. Like we spoke to a fellow tourist and he said the the beer and the pork uh, were really nice, but obviously that's so not halal mode. So I, I I couldn't really tell you much more. Travel. Ugh, 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 oh, beautiful. B, U, T, uh, full. Be beautiful. What a beauty. We went to this place called Saka. Bro, you would look out and there was mountains and it was like. It was like someone had painted it. Microsoft background, bruv. My friends went to Ninbin, that looked absolutely amazing as well. There's so many travel spots in Vietnam that you can explore. You can go to the you know serene bodies of water in Halong Bay, or you can take that motorcycle uh, tour that a lot of people do. Ho Chi Minh is a really busy, buzzing city. Even you can find luscious beaches as well in Da Nang and, and down below in Phu Quoc. And not only that, but Vietnam is so close to all the other Asian countries as well, like Cambodia, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia. So you can go and fly there as well for very cheap. Well, relatively cheap. To conclude, the things I struggled with a lot during my elective placement in Vietnam, Hanoi, were the food and the language barrier. The things I loved though during my elective placement in Vietnam, Hanoi, were the people, the fact that everything was so cheap, transport, accessibility to other countries, and Vietnam being such a beautiful, beautiful country. Would I recommend it? Honestly, being Muslim, the food is a bit of a deal breaker for me. If I'm being very honest, guys, like it's not somewhere personally I would stay for more than a week, especially in Hanoi. I would maybe stay in Hanoi for like three, four days, just because it was a really, it was really hard, you know, eating. Like there was not a lot. Um, that I found I could eat. But did I have an amazing time? Yes. And for all the reasons I stated in this video, I grew to love Vietnam. And honestly, I, I don't even think I've explored even half of Vietnam. There's so many amazing parts of Vietnam that I didn't get to explore, but that's okay because it's just another reason for me to go back and visit Vietnam. Yep, 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 yeah, buddy. That's the end of the video, dudes. Make sure to like the video, subscribe for more videos every time Tuesday, and check out these bangers as well. All right, cause I'll see you next week, innit? Bye. Bye.